one is fighting ISIS. With the advent of the internet, the nature of terrorism is changing. Work in 2019 from the Atlantic Council explained that ISIS fundamentally relied on the internet to communicate through and promote its global brand. Indeed, Cohen of Foreign Affairs in 2015 explained that the next prominent terrorist organization would be even more reliant on the digital world. Fortunately, offensive cyber operations combat terrorists online. According to Temple in 2019 from NPR, an American OCO has hacked into the 10 servers responsible for ISIS's finances, communication, and content distribution, changing passwords and deleting content. ISIS tweets fall by 75% and photos online sevenfold, leaving its media operations a shadow of its former self. The impact is stabilizing Iraq and Syria. Rogers in 2019 explained that OCOs have helped the United States take back 98% of ISIS's territory, freeing millions from slavery, and halting the genocide of religious minorities. Contention 2 is another option. Offensive cyber operations allow the United States to retaliate without starting actual conflict. Handler 19 from the Atlantic Council explained that after Iran shot down an American surveillance drone, Donald Trump came within minutes of authorizing a retaliatory airstrike. Fortunately, he responded with a cyber attack instead, preventing likely conventional escalation from Iran. Reducing tensions with Iran is important given its control of these trade reformers, where 30% of the world's oil runs through. Indeed, Tan of CNBC finds that even the risk of a U.S. attack on Iran in June increased oil prices by 5%. This is historical, historically true, as SMB Global explains that in 08, just the threat of Iran closing the strait sent oil prices skyrocketing to $147 a barrel. Consequently, Christopher in 2019 from CNBC finds that any military upset would send prices of oil to $150 to $200 a barrel. The impact is a food crisis. High fuel prices increase the price of food because shipping costs increase and cereals, grains, and wheat are diverted into biofuels. This is why the World Bank explains that the oil price spike in 08 escalated food prices, pushing 130 million people into poverty. Contention three is deterrence. Currently, our infrastructure and military systems are becoming increasingly connected, which is why Sharma in 2010 from UC Santa Cruz argued that cyber will become the primary means of warfare. Indeed, with radar, communication, and interoperability becoming crucial parts of any military, a strong cyber force is necessary as well. Already, Darwin 19 from SMP Global explained that the American military and infrastructure are vulnerable to Chinese and Russian cyber attacks, which would cause weapons, navigation systems, and supply chains to fall. Thus, the United States needs to keep up, ensuring a balance of power that prevents one-sided aggression. Giving up offensive cyber operations would be like throwing away our air force or nuclear weapons in the hopes that our enemies would follow suit. The effects of losing cyber weapons would be disastrous, as Magnus in 2011 from the University of Copenhagen writes that countries would continue to develop, developing cyber to challenge America using cyber superiority to deter us. The impact is global destabilization. Hansen from Stanford University finds that should the United States power slip, Russia would aggress towards Eastern Europe, North Korea towards South Korea, China towards Taiwan, and Pakistan towards India. Worldwide conflicts would drastically increase, potentially causing trillions of economic damages and millions of deaths. Moreover, Declines in American power will cause many other countries to spend more on their conventional and cyber military, as they lose confidence in America and Russia, and as they lose confidence in America and Russia and China become more ambitious. This will produce devastating effects for the global economy as social spending is cut and tensions increase. Thus, Agostino in 2017 from the University of Rome finds that a 1% increase in military spending as a percent of GDP decreases overall GDP by 8.5% in the long run, trapping hundreds of millions in poverty. Thus, we are proud to affirm. Perhaps we could just call for the evidence at the end of the round.
So why don't we say one more time what the tagline is for that? So if anybody wants to call Redskins around what it is, what's the tagline for that card? Like the way we. Uh, yeah, just the tag. Uh, declining U.S. Uh, hegemony causes global wars that escalate. Okay. Therefore, recession. and our first contention is devastating developing nations. U.S. offensive cyber operations have been catastrophic for developing nations for three reasons, and the first is Venezuela. The Charu of Forbes 19 explains that as political tensions escalate in Venezuela, cyber operations have become the U.S.'s preferred method for dealing with the political crisis. Indeed, Portugal of the Global Research Institute 19 explains that the U.S. shut, down, shut off the Venezuelan power grid and caused a widespread power outage during a protest to undermine President Maduro. Tragically, Corvico continues that the power grid attack shut down hospitals and housing units and restricted access to water, severely reducing the living standards of 31 million Venezuelans. Second is Chinese reverse engineering. Pigeons of Breaking Defense 14 explains that because in a cyber attack, the code of a virus is attached to an adversary's computers, it is incredibly easy for victimized governments to copy the code used to attack them and create their own cyber weapons. Indeed, Kilroth of the New York Times 19 finds that Chinese agents acquired and stole U.S. code and used the technology against Vietnam in order to secure themselves against these Chinese attacks. Vietnam passed a law censoring and centralizing the internet. Shears the national interest in AT&T rights the law will reduce Vietnamese GDP by 1.7% as companies through the region plunging thousands into poverty. Third is by forcing military spending. My thing of the PD-17 writes that the U.S. has sparked a global arms race where nations are scrambling to develop defensive and offensive cyber technology to counter the U.S. and protect themselves. Empirically, <coughs> Calcinet of the Council on Foreign Relations 18 finds that because a cyber attack provides clear evidence of vulnerability, states are three times more likely to build cyber capabilities after an attack. Specifically, Radcliffe of Defense Net 17 indicates that in the Middle East, as the arms race rages on, spending on cybersecurity will double over the next few years. Problematically, proliferating in cyberspace is expensive for developing nations with limited budgets. Pillar of the Institute of Economic Peace in 19 explains that military spending always trades off with social spending, and because social programs provide access to food, medicine, and other necessities to their citizens, a 1% increase in military spending decreases economic growth by 9%. Contention 2 is Russia. Even though historically cyber attacks have not been escalatory, Valeriano 19 explains that the U.S. has recently committed to a new, aggressive cyber strategy. Indeed, Strobel 19 of the Wall Street Journal notes that Trump has ceded control of cyber war declarations completely to the Department of Defense, allowing the DOD to operate unilaterally without confirmation from higher ops. Consequently, Jelani 19 of NBC quantified that the military has already conducted more cyber operations within the past year than any previous decade combined. Ferrante 19 of the Hill confirms that the U.S. is operating in cyberspace without any serious deliberation regarding potential outcomes. And specifically, Kaplan of MIT explains in 2019 that recent cyber attacks on Russia's power grid have pushed tensions to, tensions to the brink. Indeed, there are two scenarios in which U.S.'s offensive posture will lead to cyber war with Russia, and the first is miscalculation. Buchanan of Georgetown 18 writes that when you're on the receiving end of a hack, it's very hard to determine the intention of the intruders, and as a result, Greenberg continues that if U.S. Cyber Command were to penetrate the Russian bridge network only to prepare the battlefield, Russians could interpret it as a full-scale attack. In this situation, Kaplan of Slate 19 writes that Russia might launch a cyber attack against the U.S. to prevent the U.S. from doing it first. The second way is through retaliation. Greenberg 19 writes that Russia has threatened to retaliate with cyber force, warning that further intrusions could escalate into a cyber war. They would not hesitate because Bostock 19 writes that in many respects, the U.S. economy and infrastructure is far more reliant on digitization and automation than Russia's, giving Russia an inherent advantage in a future cyber war. In the event of such a cyber war, YC-19 finds that Russia would inevitably launch an attack on the U.S. power grid. Overall, SEV-14 writes that such an attack could inflict economic costs of $2 trillion and kill over 500,000 people as the U.S. is extremely dependent on electricity. Thus, we are proud to meet you. Thank you.
evidence from Corbico, right? Yeah. So where does Corbico get his evidence from? He gets it from an unverified source from a Russian news agency. Do you think we should trust that source? Yeah, because it's probably not biased against scores for Venezuela. Is it Russia like economic allies with Venezuela and economic enemies or geopolitical okay, enemies with first, the United okay. States? First of all, even if that's true, it doesn't matter because insofar as Russia could have detected the U.S. and attacked on Venezuela, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Russia did not detect the attack. Yes, they did. Like, Venezuela that's, that's, had a failure in their grid and then they just yeah, blamed it on the U.S. No, 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 no they blamed it on the U.S. Well, your evidence is from a Russian source. We have evidence from a French author who's like an expert on the power grid who says it was just a failure in the grid. Okay, that's 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 Can I ask a question? Sure. All right. So let's say you go for your argument about the trade-off between you know conventional military and cyber operations, right? Okay, so how, so then why would uh, why would like military spending on cyber weapons trade off with social spending? They could just take it from the other parts of the budget. Wait, isn't one of your impacts trading off on social spending in your case? No, okay, so let's say that you go. No, wait, hold on, hold on. Your case about Vietnam literally says they spend more on cyber, which trades off on social spending. You just contradicted no, yourself. Okay, no, I'm saying let's say you go for that argument. Does that mean that your argument is not true? Which doesn't mean that your case is also not true. You're just okay. stealing from yourself. I don't understand okay. what you're saying. Okay. So, on your argument about Russia and the United States hacking into Russia's grid, right? Yeah. So, who hacked into the United States grid first? Russia, but those were extremely small intrusions. And what we say, and what our evidence indicates, is that due to U.S.'s new extremely aggressive cyber policy, any further intrusions on Russia's grid will cause Russia to retaliate against U.S. And we know this okay, is true. Okay. 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 Yeah. So. You say like one of the reasons this truth because of miscalculation, right? Yeah. So if Russia's like, it's super hard for Russia to calculate like how the attack on the grid happened or like who did the attack, how are they gonna instantly know it's the United States and instantly attack us? Wait, why do you say that it's hard for, for Russia? Oh, okay, okay. So that's we, a miscalculation that you said. Okay. So first of all, no one would intrude against the Russian grid besides the US. We say that tensions between those two countries are at an all time high. There's tons of other countries that don't like Russia. There's tons of hacker groups that okay. attack Russia. Okay. But Russia, Russia would interpret this as a full-scale attack on their grid. And we say that the only people that Russia would think that do this are the US, United States. Why would Russia think that though? That seems like very illogical. Say, oh, we have a power outage, our grid might be attacked. It's instantly the United States. Let's not talk to them first. Let's just go all out and attack them. Very like, like, like they can detect where they came from, first of all. No, it's really hard to detect. I mean, I'll, I'll see evidence after, about that after the conference. Right. Can I have a question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about terrorism. Sure. We can, like, so why can't other groups fill the, fill, you know, fill the gaps? Like, why, why does the U.S. and these two, like, do these cyber operations? We have very strong cyber operations. We have good cyber force. Yeah, okay, so does the U.K. and so do hacker groups, like, analogy? Well, no, the United Kingdom actually follows the United States suit. Like, we tell the United Kingdom, like, what to hack and, like, how to hack it. This no, is why the United States took down the 10 major ISIS accounts while the United Kingdom was doing whatever they were. No, okay, so the United Kingdom also does it in addition to the United States. They're not, like, But they're not as good as us. That's what our, that's Wait, 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 okay, oh. cyber operations might have some harms, the entire world is going to militarize in terms of cyber in either world. It's a new domain of conflict, you can earn money from it, you can have a military advantage in either world. So, while the United States might contribute some sort of escalation, giving away all of our cyber weapons and not doing offensive cyber operations in any world means that all these countries have an asymmetric advantage against the United States. So, my opponents might say American cyber operations are bad, but in a world where we have no offensive cyber operations, the United States is certainly going to be even more exposed. Let's start on their first contention. So, their first piece of evidence is about Venezuela. They say Venezuela was hacked by the United States from an unsourced piece of evidence from the Russian Telesur. Obviously, this is not very reliable. Instead, France 24, which is the largest news organization in 2019, cited one of its top cyber experts and said that Venezuela's, uh, Venezuela's power grid is pretty unreliable. And said what they did was they blamed it on the United States once they got problems because they just like blaming things on other countries because a leader wants to preserve his power. Their next argument is about reverse engineering. But there's two problems here. 
Number one, their argument about Vietnam closing down the internet is simply not linked to the United States having reverse engineered weapons. They just say China is becoming more aggressive against Vietnam. Well, if China is becoming more aggressive in Vietnam, how much of that is really because of the United States' cyber weapons? More importantly, Slate explains in 2019 that basically every single country is hacked into each other's critical infrastructure if they're a major cyber power. This means that either way, someone's going to get some deadly cyber weapons, and the more important thing is that the United States just doesn't give up every single thing in the new domain that is so crucial to the new conflicts. Their third argument is that when the United States attacks countries, they increase their military spending. The problem here is A, they never quantify this argument. When the United States has a cyber attack on, for example, uh, like a country in Africa or Europe or like uh, Asia, they never tell you how much more they spend on their cyber military. Moreover, Chachak 18 of North Western University explains that the incentive to build cyber exists in either world because it's very, very inexpensive. So they never prove to you how much this cyber spending is taking away from uh, this uh, security. Lastly and most importantly, according to Mazenik of George Mason University, the United States' cyber power is actually a reassuring force. Our allies do not need to spend on cyber when they know the United States is there to back them up. However, if American power declines, Russia and China become more aggressive, and the United States is no longer able to back up our allies, then they have to spend more on cyber, then they need to spend more on conventional militaries, actually it decreases overall in my opponent's world. Then on their second tension about escalation and miscalculation. So the first problem here with their argument about miscalculation is there's no probability. There might be an increase to the chance of a massive cyber attack, but they do not outline what is the probability of this miscalculation even happening. There's no way to weigh this argument. Second of all, there's no way that Russia would immediately think that America has hacked into their power grid. They themselves tell you it's very hard to tell who is hacked into you. So if Russia's like, oh, someone infiltrated me, are they all of a sudden gonna be like, okay, let's nuke America and potentially cause a nuke war? Not very logical. Moreover, EE Energy explains in 2014 that Russia's power grid is very bad. And this was in 2014. They need $700 billion in investment. And then since then, we've imposed sanctions on Russia. They know their power grid is absolutely awful. There's absolutely no reason why they would have to attack the United States. Lastly, miscalculation improves, I mean, gets worse in my opponent's world. If the United States gives up our ability to hack, we give up our ability to hack into our opponent's systems and do things like intelligence. So if we're no longer getting intelligence, we're no longer able to know our opponent's moves, we're acting completely blindly, that's definitely miscalculation if you're acting without knowing what you're doing. Secondly, they talk about the Russia threatened to retaliate against the United States. However, they never tell you the extent of this retaliation. Would Russia want to start a war against the United States? Would Russia want to do these massive attacks? Russia's economy is dependent on oil exports, remember. And if the US economy tanks, that tanks the demand for oil around the world and Russia's economy would tank. Retaliation is never going to get to that level. Rather, Barnes 19 of the New York Times argues that most escalation stays in the gray zone. For example, we might build up capabilities, we might install mal with malware, but we never ever do these exact attacks that do the massive amount of damage my opponents say. Sure, there might be escalation. Sure, if there's a lot of escalation, there might be a war, but there's a lot of steps you need to go between those two, and they never prove those steps even happened. We urge you to vote for the affirmative side. He said that it actually goes up, but his first response told you that cyber spending wasn't actually very expensive for these nations and we don't know how many, how much it actually trades off. I'd say you shouldn't go to this argument. Go to our second attention on Russia. This is where you should be pretty comfortable signing your ballot for the The first thing he says on our argument about miscalculation is that it's not very probable. I'd argue it is. What our Kaplan evidence indicates is that right now, tensions between the US and Russia are as high as they have ever been. 
and right now, where our Buchanan evidence says that in cyberspace, because no one understands the extent of an attack, if the U.S. would intrude, Russia might perceive that as an attack on them, and as a result would have no choice other than to strike the U.S. to prevent them from doing it good. But the next thing they say is there's no way that Russia would do it. Even if Russia might never think it is in their best interest, if Russia feels that the cyber war is escalating, Russia has no choice. Because in an event where they think the U.S. is trying to attack their power grid, the only way for Russia's regime to survive is to attack back on the U.S. Then they say you need $7 trillion of investment. That evidence, as he said, is from 2014. What the BBC explains in 2019 is that Russia has taken steps to, to make their power grid more secure. In fact, they have recently passed a law in which the power grid can be disconnected from the internet on the Russian government's command. That's really important, because it means that Russia is far more protected, the United States is not. And then they give you a turn, saying that telling this is going to happen. I'd argue this doesn't matter unless Russia has an incentive to attack. And the only reason why Russia would ever want to do something as escalatory as shutting off the US power grid, for example, is if they thought the US was going to attack them first. Then, on our second one about retaliation, they say they're really dependent on oil experts and they would never want to. We would say, even if this is true, it does not matter in the context for Russia, because what our boss with evidence says is that Russia perceives the US threat and these intrusions as an existential threat to their regime's survival, which means that even if it would hurt their economy a little, if they think their security interests are threatened by the US, they would need to strike first. The next thing they say is about the gray zone. This is very historic, and we agree. But what our Hill evidence from case indicates is that the United States has taken a far different policy and a far more aggressive policy that risks severe miscalculation and risks going over into war. And we would say even if they've been in the gray zone before, right now Trump is making changes, and right now the risk of miscalculation is high. Let's go to their case. Their first argument is about ISIS. What Cacarello explains in 2019 is that ISIS right now is more powerful than they have ever been, which implies two things. A, it means that cyber has not been very effective in countering them if they're powerful right now. But B, it means that the old, the old approach before cyber, where the US had military force in the Middle East, was preferable. But se this is why Secretary of Defense asked Carter literally come, came out and said that most people in the Department of Defense do not think that cyber was an effective way to deal with terrorism. The people doing these operations don't think they were. They give you two reasons, they give you like a bunch of reasons why. Primarily, it's if it's about like recruitment. But what Gilstein in 2019 explains is that the majority of the people who are on these servers are people who are already radicalized. It doesn't help them recruit new members, rather it just helps them organize with the ones that already have, not a big impact. But then on the funding debate, what Kenner explains is that on hand right now, ISIS has hundreds of millions of dollars they can use to fund attacks, which means at the end of the day, ISIS is still successful, it did not go away from the Their second contention here comes about a third option. They say that Trump did do an airstrike. I'd argue there's four reasons he wouldn't do it anyway. First, it would destroy his relations with Middle Eastern nations. Second, it would, it would lead him to lose domestic credibility. Third, it would damage oil fields, which for the US is pretty bad. But fourth, it would lead to Iran retaliating militarily, which is obviously not what Trump wants as he's trying to get elected. But more generally, what Slayton and the Gulf War Center explained in 2017 is that cyber can never replace conventional warfare because in cyberspace, it's very hard to deal a decisive blow because it is hard to do something, I would say, to prevent the other side from attacking back, which means that at the end of the day, this just means that it would never work. Their third argument here is about deterrence. I argue deterrence doesn't work. Our bastard evidence from case, which they don't respond to, indicates that Russia is far more reliant or far, far less reliant on these nations than us. That means they don't deter. They aren't there deterring. They know they can win the war. Second of all, I would argue that even if the U.S. is doing a little bit of deterrence right now, in order for escalation or miscalculation to happen, it only takes one attack that goes too far. It's not a sustainable solution. The idea that the U.S. and Russia can have influence in each other's power grid and that's somehow going to lead to not nuclear tension, to me, sounds pretty ridiculous. But then they say, if we like gave up our cyber weapons, what Moore explains is that if we did that, we'd have more resources to allocate to defensive cyber operations. I'd argue that's preferable because it's A, not escalatory, but B, it can guard against attacks. And at the end of the day, that's the best way to defend our hegemony, <coughs> only in their homes that happen.
United States is an existential threat, right? Yeah. So why does Russia think the United States is an existential threat? A bunch of reasons. I mean, primarily because they're like competing heads of They're like yeah. competing security interests. Right, because like the United States is pretty powerful and like it would be a bad war and stuff like that, right? right. So isn't the way to guarantee that, you know, a war would be pretty bad with the United States is if you have a power outage and then some, if you try to challenge some existential threat and then you get sure, shot right. back. I mean, yeah, this is really important, right? Because I argue with the cyber operations, the US pushes Russia into a war. Obviously, it's not in best interest for Russia to go to war and keep striking the powers. It's never in any state's best interest to go to war. But states always do, is they feel if their existence is threatened, they have no choice other than okay, to lash so out. Like, here's the jump I think is happening here, right? United States hacking into Russia does not mean that Russia thinks that they are destroyed forever or like they're existentially threatened. There's a balance of power. Like you yourself tell me Russia is hacking into the United States as well, right? The United States developing nuclear weapons and Russia developing nuclear weapons create a balance of power. Us developing jets, F-35, uh, yeah. like Su-32, that creates a balance of power. That's what happens. It doesn't mean that Russia all of a sudden believes that they're gonna die. Right, no, here's, here's the analysis though, right? I would contend that Russia feels as if the US intrusions in a lot of ways threaten the survival of the regime, right? Okay. A, because, right, yeah. So the argument here would be is that because of that, even though there can be a bigger threat in the world than the last out, the world they're living in right now is one that they're threatened. And as long as that's true, even if the world might get worse after they attack, if they feel that like right now there's a threat, they would still have like, I don't think that responds to my idea that Russia wouldn't do like a massive attack, they just maintain a balance. Well, here, though, here's why they would have to do a massive attack. Because Russia knows that it could win the cyber war. Because again, we've offered evidence, which you didn't respond to, which indicates that Russia is far more far more. Okay, so Russia, what is Russia going to do in the United States? Like shut down our entire power grid? Maybe, maybe not. So, like, like, wouldn't that potentially Russia. invite like a nuclear strike back on Russia? That, that's pretty bad. I don't think so. So if Russia oh, attacked yeah, our yeah. entire power grid, yeah. shut us down, no economic growth, no like no transportation, the United States would not retaliate on Russia. We would retaliate. There's no way we would do a nuclear strike. Why not? Because why would you launch? So it? they would just back. Yeah, well, why would they do that if we can move them back? It's a balance of power, right? right I think I definitely no, think if Russia no, did something as aggressive as that, hold on. there would definitely be some repercussions. Hold, hold on, this is the argument I'm making, right? Obviously, the U.S. is going to retaliate, but again, the Russian knows the U.S. is retaliating. Right. The calculus that Russia would have to make is that if the U.S. shut off the power grid, they would have nowhere for it. But this is what's really important. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm gonna, like, so you so don't answer think question, right? Okay. Answer question, right? So the argument here, right, is that insofar as Russia is going, insofar as when Russia attacks, the most likely retaliation from the U.S. would also be okay. in cyberspace. So I think these are assertions. Can we get to the next another question? No, I, I mean we're going in circles. Like, can we, okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So on the argument about um, on the argument about this idea that like somehow we like. If you like vote, uh, vote, vote, I guess like all of our cyber operations go away, right? So if yeah, that's that, voting con, yeah. if that happens, okay, yeah, right? Yeah. So if that happens, right? What do you think the U.S. is going to do? Um, maybe invest in defense. Okay, so if that is true, right, and the U.S. invests more in defense, how does that make the world more secure? Because more? because defense is not always going to be offense. We're already investing something in defense, but if we have, we only invest in like for example things that shoot down nuclear missiles, Russia would be like, oh, we can be more aggressive because defense isn't 100% protective. However, deterrence but does I don't think Russia, I don't think I Russia think, would be able to I don't think 100% defense, defense is a very viable policy. You need to have both in order to maintain a balance right, of power. We're obviously going to that. Cyber attacks are very, very espionage esque, and it's very hard to tell which which country a cyber attack comes from. So it's going to be difficult for Russia to tell if the United States attack them, which means they're not going to be able to miscalculate easily. He's going to have to confirm it, and they're going to have to wait for a while. That's going to form into channels, things like that, to solve for it. This argument is not very likely. Then, they also try to say that Russia's power grid is actually being solved for right now. However, even if Russia's power grid is being solved for right now, they A, don't prove that like the, the fundamental issues in it, like it's crashing and stuff like that, are going to be solved. They just say they're trying to increase its security. That's not solving the inherent problems in it. But B, even if this is true, Russia is still going, this is like going to take a very long time to happen. They just say Russia wants to do it. There's no evidence that's saying that Russia has done it. Then, the really easy way you can take out their contention on retaliation and everything is that cyber operations stay within the gray zone of conflict. This means that they're not escalatory. Our Barnes evidence from 2019 and the New York Times indicates this. They try to say this evidence is very historic. That's not true. You can read our evidence at the end of the round. It talks about current United States offensive cyber operations, for instance, against Iran, Russia, and actors throughout the world, and it's saying that they're not escalatory. We keep them in the gray zone, and that Russia is not going to lash out in the way that they do. On to our case. 
The first response they read to our argument on deterrence is that cyber is not going to be very, very effective in battles and stuff like that. However, I would argue that it is, because our airplanes, radars, and all these other things are based on communications, internet, and electricity. A cyber attack could change the, uh, change the tide of a battle, and so far as it could hack the airplanes or hack the radar, making the United States a lot weaker. Their other response is that deterrence does not work in cyberspace, and that Russia is, very, is, Russia is less digitalized than America. However, even if Russia is a little bit less digitalized than America, that doesn't matter that much because the United States can still leak massive damage on Russia through a cyber attack if that deterrence still applies. And also, this is not our argument. We are not arguing for deterrence in the cyberspace. We are arguing that cyber is key for deterrence in the conventional space because according to our Sharma evidence from UC Santa Cruz, cyber is key for all of our militaries. Essentially, throwing away cyber would be akin to the loss of our air force or nuclear weapons. It would ruin the balance of power throughout the world. That's why our Magnus evidence from the University of Copenhagen says that countries would deter us and become more aggressive which is why our Hansen evidence says that Russia, North Korea, Pakistan, and China would all aggress, risking millions of lives and trillions of dollars. Even if this aggression does not occur, other nations are going to have to increase their own conventional military spending, their own military spending, which is going to cut social spending, slashing economic growth in the long term. The other response my opponents read to this argument is that deterrence is not sustainable. However, we're not talking about cyber deterrence. We're talking about conventional deterrence, which has been sustainable. We've seen deterrence work for years upon years, decades upon decades. Their last response is that we can have more money for defense. However, defense is not going to be able to win battles in cyber. With defense and cyber operations, we can't hack into airplanes and things like this. This impact is not very probable. We outweigh in two ways. First of which, this calculation is going to occur throughout the entire world if there's a fundamental shift in the balance of power, which means it's going to be more complex like my opponent's argument. And second of all, on scope, because my opponents are only concentrating on Russia and the United States. We're talking about complex throughout the entire world, bigger impact overall. Start on our argument about Russia. Although cyber attacks historically have not been escalatory, our evidence indicates that the U.S. just signed on to a new aggressive cyber policy that has been increasing tensions with Russia because we've been increasing our hacking into their grid. They, uh, on our link about miscalculation, we say that since it's harder to determine the intentions of a cyber attack, Russia could misinterpret, the, uh, misinterpret these operations and, as a result, do a full-scale attack against the U.S. They say it's difficult to tell if the U.S. attacks them. This, this response is good for us for two reasons. First of all, it's good for us because it means that because since it's hard to tell who attacked them, it increases Russia's fear that the US attacked them. But then it also takes out their link, it also takes out their link about deterrence. Because if no one knows who the US attacked them, because if no one knows who attacked them in a cyber attack, then that means that no countries are going to be deterred. They really shoot themselves in the foot with this argument. But then they say that Russia is going to lash out with nuclear weapons. 
that doesn't really matter because insofar as a power grid is going to take out the entire, like a, 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 an attack on the US grid is going to take out the entire US grid and nuclear weapons are likely to, and, and conventional weapons are likely connected to that grid, you're not going to be able to use conventional weapons. But then they say that Russia's power grid is bad. No, our evidence indicates it's very, very, very specific. Our evidence says that the Russian grid is far less reliant on digitization and automation than the US grid. And as a result, they have an inherent advantage in a future cyber war. Go to our arguments about retaliation. We say that Russia literally said that if we further, if we intrude further on Russia's power grid, then they are going to attack the US. You know that's a 100% probability because Russia literally said it. But then our, our boss's evidence indicates that since Russia is not scared of a US attack because they're far less reliant on digitization and automation in the US. They say that, uh, that, that cyber ops are non-escalatory, uh, but then again, recognize that the evidence that we read at the top of the page literally says that our new aggressive policy is extremely escalatory, and in the coming months, there's going to be an increase in retali retaliation. Then, our impact is this. Our, our set of evidence indicates that when Russia attacks the US, it's brutal because the US is so dependent on electricity, it can cause economic losses of $2 trillion dollars and kill 500,000 people. Go to Wang. Our argument is more probable than theirs because we actually wrote to the Times. Our argument is about the new policy that Russia, uh, that the US recently adapted. They're just talking about cyber operations in the past, which is I I extremely not, I extremely non unique because it, like, it, uh, it's, it's extremely not true because we, the, because the new policy um, it makes air escalation really likely in the future. But then on time frame, recognize that in, in, in the long term, having probes in each other's grid is not a good long term solution. All it can lead to is escalation. But then on scope, right, uh, then we also link in because, it, it because definition if you have a cyber war between the US and Russia, it's definitely going to destabilize the entire world. But then on strength, their impact is extremely crazy. Just because we don't have one part of our military doing anything, it doesn't mean that the entire world is going to be destabilized. Go to their case, they're not linked here. First of all, they delink themselves by saying that there's no attribution with cyber attacks. But that definitely means is that there's no deterrence because no one knows that the US is doing cyber attacks with them. Again, that only strengthens our link about miscalculations. On defense and offense trail, we see that defense is better than offensive cyber operations because they're less escalatory. They say you can't hack into places, but definitely Initially, since defensive operations are less escalatory, it doesn't matter because there's going to be no need for escalation because no country's going to attack us anyway since there's no escalation. For these reasons, we are the only argument to actually stand in both sides.
because they don't know what the probability analysis is. That's why they don't know what the calculation is. Let's do a little bit like probability analysis, right? Yeah. So the probability that there is a power outage in Russia, and then I don't know who attacked me, that, and then I attack the United States, that, that, like, the probability of that leading to an existential threat is like very low, I because I don't know who it is. It could have been a, like just a random power outage, and the United States isn't necessarily going to try to kill me. On the other hand, the probability of me attacking the United States and then they attack me back is very high. So I think Russia, when they see an existential threat, the higher existential threat is actually just randomly striking out America with basically circumstantial evidence that would not even get like, I don't know, like get anywhere in like any courtroom. Like literally no one would leave them. starting on our case and moving back to their case. Starting on our case, our argument is that increasing the world is dependent on cyber and especially our conventional military systems. The United States, according to Hanson, uh, Stanford University, needs to preserve that power by maintaining our offensive of cyber operations. Otherwise, other countries will be more aggressive. Russia and Eastern Europe, China and the South China Sea, Pakistan and India, it's all around the world. Now, what do my students say in response? First of all, they say we contradict ourselves. They say that nations do not know that we're hacking them, so we cannot have any deterrent. That's not our argument. Our argument is that in either world, everyone in this room knows the United States is trying to hack into militaries. And they've already hacked into several infrastructures. We do have a deterrent effect. Our argument is that the reason why their logic contradicts themselves is that they're saying is any specific power outage, they'll automatically assume it's America. But if they don't know if that specific power outage is because of America, that seems like a pretty irrational decision of Russia. And certainly some assertions by high school debaters is not going to solve that. Secondly, they say, well, just invest in defense instead with no evidence, no quantification of how effective this defense is. We tell you deep, no defense is 100% perfect, and it's impossible to preserve a balance of power by only doing defense. Any system is impossible to make impossible, uh, impossible to make impossible to hack to. So we need to preserve our balance of power by having hacking. This is why our case wins the round. Because number one, even if they win their argument about miscalculation, we are still winning on this round because miscalculation around the world increases if the United States' balance of power goes down. So even if my opponents win miscalculation, miscalculation happens in my opponent's world. Secondly, let's move on to my opponent's case. There's literally no way you can vote here. My opponents think you can go A to B. The US hacks, and therefore there is a war. The problem is they're going A to Q, and they're missing B, C, D, E, F, G, and H as well. Number one, the energy grid is absolutely awful in Russia. They say Russia has introduced a plan to put them off the internet. That isn't solving back for the fact that their power grid is very unreliable. Their coal plants suck. Their like cables suck. It's going to go off all the time. And they've probably gone off like 10 times in the last year, and they should have had this war already if Russia really thought this. Number two, remember, they can't really tell if the United States is them, like themselves tell you. And number three, our evidence from the 2019 is literally talking about Trump's policy. Even though he is more escalatory than before, he's making sure it doesn't actually lead to that escalatory level. No probability on my opponent's argument. Even then, our argument outweighs. Please vote for the affirmative side. Let's go to our case. 
He's, he, 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 he sends a bunch of letters, but he's not interacting with the warrants. Our argument is pretty simple. When the United States continually attacks Russian power grids, and when they continually do implants, the only risk is that Russia would eventually retaliate, even if they don't know specifically what's happening. They know that if the United States continually has implants in the Russian power grid, and if Russia perceives that as an existential threat to regime survival, the probability of miscalculation and eventually retaliation are very high. Obviously, we are not saying that Russia would immediately attack the power grids on day one, but the more the U.S. attacks Russia, and the more Russia attacks them back, that's when the side war escalates, and that's when eventually you are going to see conflict that eventually will be really bad. They say three things. The first they say the grids are really weak. Our BBC evidence says that Russia has some of these, our boss, first of all, our boss of evidence says that Russia knows they can win the side war because they're much less reliant on digitization. But second of all, our BBC evidence says that Russia has had the ability to detach their power grid from the internet, which is the best way to defend against an attack. That is really clear right there. The next thing they say is that we can't actually tell who did it. But we would argue this just proves our point because you can't tell who's attacking you. That means any intrusion to trigger a Russian response. And then they say that, that their evidence is really old. But again, we would contend that as we move into the future, our Catholic evidence says that tensions are higher right now than they have ever been. And because that's a bad thing, you shouldn't be